Welcome everyone to the recorded webinar series on LED-based photoacoustic imaging. My name is Mithun and I'm a research and business development manager at Cyberdyne. In this series, several key opinion leaders in the field of photoacoustics will talk about LED-based photoacoustic imaging and its preclinical and clinical applications. Today's exciting talk will be about LED-based molecular photoacoustic imaging and will be delivered by Dr. Jesse Jokust, who is an associate professor at University of California, San Diego. Prior to joining UC San Diego, Dr. Jokust was a postdoctoral fellow and an instructor in the Department of Radiology at Stanford University. He holds a PhD in chemistry from UT Austin and has published more than 75 articles in multiple peer-reviewed journals. He is a recipient of the prestigious NIH Pathway to Independence Award, NIH New Innovator Award, and NSF Career Award. In this talk, Dr. Jokust will explain his lab's efforts in exploring the potential of LED-based photoacoustics in molecular imaging applications. With that, I will turn it over to Dr. Jokust. Well, hello, my name is Jesse Jokerst, and today I'm happy to talk to you a little bit about my lab's work um, using photoacoustic imaging and particularly LED-based photoacoustic molecular imaging to improve the diagnosis and management of disease. So by and large, photoacoustic imaging works to improve contrast in ultrasound. And so this is a ultrasound image of a mass on the ovary. And so UB here is the urinary bladder. And if you're a trained radiologist or we draw in arrows, you can maybe identify that this is a mass. But you can also appreciate that there's relatively low contrast between this mass and the adjacent healthy tissue. So these images were collected with conventional pulse echo ultrasound, where there's some sort of transducer that emits and receives pressure waves. And these pressure waves bounce off the sample and then return to the transducer. And so this is what uh, generates contrast in conventional ultrasound. What photoacoustic imaging does and photoacoustic ultrasound is it combines the temporal and spatial features of ultrasound with the contrast and spectral nature of optics. So we still get video frame rate, um, hundreds of frames per second. We also get very good uh, spatial resolution deep into tissue based on the center frequency of the transducer, but we also start to have good contrast based on optics and the spectral nature of optics. So uh, conventional ultrasound, sound in, sound out. In photoacoustic ultrasound, we have light in, sound out. And so the uh, basic technology was described by Alexander Graham Bell over 100 years ago, but it hasn't been until the last 20 years or so that the transducers have become sensitive enough, the lasers have become uh, fast enough that people have been using this for medical imaging. So the mechanism is thermal expansion. And so if we think about this, there's an incident light pulse. It can be, here it's shown as a laser, but of course it can also be a pulse laser diode or a light emitting diode. And this incident light is, um, is absorbed and scattered in the tissue. And some regions absorb more light than others. And so in those regions, there's a local temperature rise. And this uh, very short and spatially confined temperature rise leads to thermal expansion. And this thermal expansion creates pressure waves, which can back propagate out of the tissue, can be detected with ultrasound transducers, and then can be reconstructed to form an image. And so the nice thing about photoacoustics is that I don't care how many times this photon has been scattered. I only care about when it's been absorbed, because the absorption event is what directly correlates to the photoacoustic signal. Um, so in addition to this, we get the uh, the feature of a feature of optics where we can excite at 650, 750, 850 nanometers and can essentially have red, green, and blue ultrasound. Of course, the ultrasound is uh, all at the same range of frequencies because these transducers have relatively wide band passes, but we can excite them at different um, wavelengths. And so therefore, we can have multiple color channels of information, which is difficult with conventional ultrasound. So good contrast, good ultrasound, the ability to do multiplexing, 
ultrasound, of course, used in a variety of areas of medicine. People uh, tend to think primarily of monitoring pregnancy. It's useful there, but also useful in a lot of other areas. We do have some limitations. It's still difficult to go through thick bone, um, human bone. It's difficult to get light and sound um, through bones like the skull. It's also difficult to transmit sound or at least ultrasound through air. And so uh, we typically need to use some kind of coupling gel. There's also a finite depth, right? We, even though we can go much deeper than we can with conventional optical microscopy, we are still limited to about three to five centimeters in total, total depth, simply because the technique uh, still requires light. So uh, the community has largely began using um, OPO lasers, uh, tunable lasers, um, the advantages of these are that they generally have very high energy pulses, uh, short laser pulses, uh, fairly good rep rates. The limitation is that they're very delicate, they're very expensive, they're very bulky, um, they require a lot of babysitting, they require a lot of maintenance. And so as the field has recently moved more into pulse laser diodes and light emitting diodes, I've been a real advocate for these because I appreciated how um, inexpensive these LEDs are. They're compact, they're stable. And so when we think about transitioning this work and photoacoustics to the clinic, the, the medical community and our medical collaborators don't have time to fine tune a laser. They don't have time to babysit a laser. They need a light source that is always gonna be on, always gonna work and is gonna do that. With, uh, with, with relatively little, if any, maintenance. And so that's what LEDs offer. And that's why um, I've been um, excited about using them for photoacoustic imaging and some of my translational work. So uh, this system is from Cyberdyne, originally described as Prexion. And so I think um, I bought my first system from them. If this paper was 2018, that must have been 2017 that we brought one of the systems on here to UC San Diego. And so this paper was our first on that topic and described some of the uh, analytical figures of merit and the performance of the, of the instrument. So the, the LEDs are on either side of a conventional transducer. So this is a, this is a, a let's see, 10 megahertz center frequency transducer. And then on the top and the bottom is an LED strip. And you can appreciate the imaging plane here in pink and the LEDs coming on either side. So the optical path um, is from these LEDs on either side. Behind these LEDs is a heat sink uh, to, to pull away some of the heat that these generate. So 50 to 150 nanosecond pulses at rep rates from one to, K, one to 4K kilohertz. Um, there's a variety of wavelengths available. The ones we're using are 690 and 850. Um, and here are some of the powers um, of those pulses. So uh, 128 element linear array um, and the acoustic focal point is about 15 millimeters away from the center, or excuse me, from the depth uh, of the surface of the transducer. So conventional, um, conventional acoustics, um, but a lot of the novelty around these LEDs or at least the combination and then the triggering on the backside of the instrument. So um, this can also be used with a motorized stage to image uh, small animals. Of course, on the back end is a DAC, uh, the LED driver to, uh, to, to coordinate the pulse and the receive. Um, so just some more information about it, 14 bits with 1024 samples per element. Um, and then a variety of uh, reconstruction methods. I'll talk about some that we've developed in the lab later. Um, but most conventionally delay in some and Fourier transform analysis. So one of the first things we wanted to do is characterize the beam profile. So here we created a phantom. This is just a simple agar phantom and put uh, different lengths of pencil lead. So this is uh, just simply the graphite from a mechanical pencil. And we put these periodically spaced across in this phantom. So every one of these should have the same um, photoacoustic intensity. And so when we created an image and then did a line profile across, you notice there's slightly more signal in the center than on the side. So we could quantitate that a little bit 
further to understand the variation. And I think it's up to 15 or 20% lower signal on the edges than in the center. So this was important to understand how much signal variation we might get in a spatial, uh, in a scan. We next looked at LED beam stability. So uh, both in water and in air, uh, you can, there's, uh, there's more stability in water and that's because the water is acting as an even better heat sink. And so um, as these LEDs uh, become warmer over time, particularly in air, there can be a decrease <clears throat> in the power output, particularly at these higher rep rates. But by and large, these are relatively um, minor issues. Um, and so let's see, a decrease here, I think also of about 15%. But this is important, right? Because in photoacoustics, the signal is directly proportional to the uh, incident light pulse uh, fluence. So 14 degrees C temperature increase in the heat sink um, at 1K, this was only 3.5 degrees C. Um, and so the actual LED itself is not warming up very much, it's actually that heat sink. So there's no risk of burning the, uh, the, the animal subject or the human subject. Next, we looked at uh, axial resolution. So this is a human hair in a 1% agar phantom. And we could measure this with light microscopy to be right at 100 microns. And then we could create a photoacoustic B-mode image of that hair and look at the full width half max and measure this um, axial resolution um, at 268 microns and then could create um, a number of uh, averages over time and, uh, and estimated this uh, axial resolution of the instrument. We also looked at the lateral resolution. So here we printed lines with varying spacing. So the numbers you see here are the spacing between these lines. So this is just on a piece of transparency film from an overhead projector. We printed this with an inkjet printer, cut this out and imaged it. So you can see when the lines are 1.1 millimeters of cross, it's very easy to resolve them, even still at uh, 0.75. But at 0.55 millimeters, it's actually quite difficult to resolve these lines. And so we reported in this first paper that the lateral uh, resolution is somewhere between 590 microns and 560 microns. The next sort of just proof of principle was to try to understand the penetration depth. And so here we took, <clears throat> again, a piece of pencil lead and put it under increasing concentra uh, excuse me, increasing thicknesses of chicken breast, uh, simply to, to model uh, human tissue. We used the 850 nanometer LEDs as the illumination source, and we looked at a variety of imaging uh, parameters, both in terms of different imaging depths and in terms of different uh, rep rates. And so you can appreciate at 1.8 centimeters, it's very easy to still discriminate uh, the, the pencil lead in the tissue. At deeper 2.4 centimeters, you can still very obviously see this at 3.2, we start to get a lower signal to, or excuse me, contrast to background ratio. So if we look here at our, at our contrast, this is the signal of the pencil lead versus the signal of the background adjacent tissue. You can appreciate our detection limit here at three um, and how this uh, changes as a function of uh, these different rep rates. Regardless, we were still confident that we could image up to three centimeters deep into tissue. So this is um, just as a, as a side interest, just to try to understand the sensitivity of this instrument in terms of uh, molecular imaging. So we looked at some conventional dyes, indocyanine green, methylene blue, dye R, um, which, are, which are commonly used in photoacoustic imaging. We put these uh, dyes at different concentrations inside an agar, inside of a uh, tube that has been sealed and um, use these at, a, at different excitation wavelengths. We were measuring in the low tens of micromolars is where our detection limit was. So here we're imaging at about nine micromolars of indocyanine green, um, higher concentrations uh, for, for methylene blue and dye R. And this is a function of the dye, the dye's properties, what it does with light when it absorbs it, um, its fluorescence, quantum yield, et cetera. But this can be a good metric to compare 
um, across <clears throat> various uh, imaging systems. Uh, the, the final validation at the time in 2008, my lab still had a large effort on in vivo cell tracking. So this is um, useful in regenerative medicine to understand what happens to stem cells after they've been implanted. Are they alive? Are they dead? Are they interacting with the surrounding tissue? How many of them are there? So these are all questions that uh, molecular imaging is ideally suited to answer. So here we took dye R, which is a well-known infrared dye that's used for cell imaging and also has a good photoacoustic signal. And we labeled uh, mesenchymal stem cells, human mesenchymal stem cells with dye R. And then we injected these uh, cells, 400,000 cells, which is generally well below the uh, number of cells that would be used in the human scenario into animals and, and image them with this LED-based system. Um, some of the controls were DIR only um, the, and, and also the uh, stem cells without any dye. So what you're looking at here is the pre-injection image. Um, on the right, I'm sorry, on the left is the photoacoustic data and on the right is the photoacoustic plus ultrasound. So this red is the uh, photoacoustic data and um, this is overlaid then on top of the, uh, the ultrasound data. So here you can appreciate the skin of the animal. Um, when we simply just place the needle and inject dye and then remove the needle, okay, when we just inject the contrast agent, this is a good positive control, we can image it. When we uh, simply just inject um, cells, you do see a little bit of, um, excuse me, these are labeled cells, you see the labeled cells, and then when we inject the unlabeled cells, there is uh, no photoacoustic signal. So uh, negative control, positive control, and then our cells. So just a, a very simple proof of principle that uh, we could use this, uh, this scanner, this LED-based scanner, in small animals to <clears throat> uh, quantitate a molecular imaging phenotype. Okay, so then some other applications in the field after this initial validation, I'd like to talk to you about one in reactive oxygen species, another in wound care, and then uh, talk to some more about some of the, uh, the algorithms that we're using to improve this data. So reactive oxygen and nitrogen species um, are very common. They're implicated in um, aging, they're implicated in heart disease, atherosclerosis. You might also have heard these called as uh, ROS, simply reactive oxygen species, but we like the term reactive oxygen and nitrogen because there are often nitrogen um, used in these systems. And so this was a paper published by my student Ali Hariri, who has been a, a real, the, the, the main point of contact on these first two papers and really has pioneered a lot of this work. Um, that we published in, in scientific reports. Um, and so we, we did uh, a small in vitro study to validate that this system could be used for, for further molecular imaging. So reactive oxygen and nitrogen species, as I mentioned, implicated in uh, cell signal transduction, inflammation, cancer. These are the free radicals that and you might hear about in the lay press. Uh, but regardless, these induce oxidative and uh, nitrogen-based stressors that uh, can be detrimental to many um, physiological processes. So ROS are, are, are produced by cells and can lead to DNA damage, protein modification, lipid peroxidation. And so uh, measuring these is very um, interesting, both from a practical and from a basic science perspective. Part of the problem is that these are very short-lived species. So if we want to do a blood draw, by the time the blood is drawn, these species have already uh, ceased to exist. And so imaging is ideally suited to quantitate reactive oxygen and nitrogen species because when we're doing imaging, we're inherently doing an in vivo experiment, which is in real time. So techniques for monitoring ROS often include these uh, small molecule fluorophores, but unfortunately, they're not very sensitive to a specific species. So there's dozens of reactive oxygen and nitrogen species, and uh, none of these small molecule fluorophores have, have much of a specificity. Um, they're simply an indicator of the degree of oxidative stress. They're also susceptible to light, oxygen, and temperature changes. Um, fluorescence can also suffer from autofluorescence. Um, there can be uh, relatively green wavelengths, 
which uh, limits the penetration through tissue and uh, can, can uh, hamper the ability to do long-term imaging. Chemiluminescence is another alternative here. Uh, chemiluminescence avoids autofluorescence. It generally has better penetration depth because there is no uh, background fluorescence. It has si higher signal to background ratios, but it also suffers from uh, scattering because we're moving these uh, photons through tissue. So this motivates us to look at photoacoustic imaging to quantitate these reactive oxygen and nitrogen species. And this was a molecule pioneered by Kanye Poo's lab at Nanyang Technical University in Singapore, uh, where it has this reactive oxygen and nitrogen um, sensitive uh, responsive group shown here in blue, and this near IR reporting group in red. And so um, in the presence of the, uh, the reactive oxygen or nitrogen species, this leaving group leaves and we are left with this, um, this photoacoustically active species that can report the presence of these uh, small molecules. So we first looked at the absorption of this dye at different concentrations of reactive oxygen species. And so here, I believe we're looking at hydrogen peroxide. And so you can appreciate with the dye only at 700 nanometers, there's relatively low absorbance at 700 nanometers. As we increase to higher and higher concentrations of the hydrogen peroxide, you can appreciate this very obvious change in absorption. And so if we're doing photoacoustic imaging at 700 nanometers, you can appreciate that at higher concentrations of hydrogen peroxide, we're going to have higher absorbance at 700 nanometers, which will in turn, if we're imaging at 700 nanometers, uh, lead to higher photoacoustic signal. So we first looked at uh, the, the specificity of different reactive oxygen species. So peroxynitrate very obviously turned on this dye, hydrogen peroxide very obviously turned on this dye, but it was relatively insensitive to superoxide, hypochlorite, etc. So um, this motivated us to, to further study the dye. One interesting point is that the dye itself, even in the absence of a reactive oxygen species, has some issues with stability, particularly when we used it with a conventional laser-based system. So a conventional laser-based system was giving us about 13 millijoules per centimeter squared of fluence. And even in just the, without any dye, we see this really obvious uh, decrease in photoacoustic signal over time because the laser was simply degrading the dye. Um, when we use this with uh, the, the Cyberdyne LED-based system, you can see the, uh, the laser was very, very constant. I'm sorry, the LED system gave us a very, very uh, constant photoacoustic signal. And this is because of the lower energy of this LED-based system. So this is the crux of the issue, right? The laser-based system is in low millijoules, the LED is at low microjoules, but it's because of this high rep rate that we're doing. We're doing one to four uh, thousand hertz rep rate. And that rep rate is what compensates for this relatively low fluence. And in this case, we were motivated to use this low fluence because it could uh, minimize this degradation to the dye that occurred in the presence of the laser. So again, the same uh, motivations that I talked about earlier in terms of LEDs, low cost, compact, stable, no need for a light tight enclosure because we're not using a laser um, and the imaging conditions here were all the same. Um, we, I, I showed you earlier how the dye has a strong absorbance at 700 nanometers. And so this matches the LED that we had been using, which is at 690 nanometers. And so um, that was a good fit and again gave us this very stable performance in the uh, LED system. And then here is comparing these two. And with the LED, we have less than 2% signal loss. Um, <clears throat> so after validating the system, we could go on and look at uh, some of the different performances of the dye. 
Um, here is the dye concentration. And so again, hopefully more dye equals more absorbance equals more photoacoustic signal, which we're happy to see. Um, we could also then hold the dye concentration constant and look at different concentrations of our reactive oxygen species. And so at higher and higher concentrations of peroxynitrate, we get higher and higher photoacoustic signal. With hydrogen peroxide, we see this up to a certain point and then a hook effect, perhaps because we're um, just even more strongly degrading the dye. Regardless, we're seeing detection limits in the low micromolars for both of these systems. So then we could uh, take the, the, the dye and dope it into human blood and human plasma and quantitate our limit of detection. So this is again for peroxynitrate. And here we're still, even in the, uh, even with this higher background from blood and plasma, we're still imaging in tens of micromolars, which is more than suitable for, for most uh, physiological applications. So then we could start to look at um, endogenously produced species. So here we took SKOV3, which is uh, well known to generate excessive free radicals. We also used N-acetylcysteine as a Ross scavenger. And here our independent measurement was DCFDA. So this is this fluorophore. So on the left, I'm showing you cells that are producing these RON species with our uh, independent Ross reporter and they're glowing green. On the right, um, I have, we, we've added the DCFDA again, but this N-acetylcysteine scavenger, and there's no fluorescence. So this is suggesting that indeed our model works. And so when we then use this model um, with, our, uh, with the, 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 the small molecule photoacoustic reporter and the LED-based system, we see differences both in the absorption spectra as well as in the photoacoustics. And so on, the, in, in this tube right here, so these are simply tubes that we put our cells in and then immobilized and raster scanned our transducer across to, to quantitate the photoacoustic signal. Uh, these cells um, without any probe, as you might expect, have no signal. When we add the cells plus the probe plus a scavenger, we see some signal. And then the, uh, the cells with the probe have the highest signal here because um, there's no scavenger to reduce the concentration of ROS. So here, this indeed, I think, was the first paper to uh, report uh, uh, this type of molecular imaging with uh, LEDs. Uh, the probe was sensitive to peroxynitrate and hydrogen peroxide, but insensitive to other RON species. Um, our sensitivities were in the low micromolar, uh, both in buffer and in blood. Um, and then we validated this with, with uh, tissue culture. So this, uh, again, underscores the value of using this probe and uh, the value of using this transducer uh, for photolabile or photosensitive contrast agents. Next, I'd like to talk to you about some work we've been doing with wound imaging. And so you might think, why would you ever need to image wounds? You can see them by eye. This is actually a major problem. So uh, wounds are about a $30 billion problem in the United States, particularly as the population continues to age. Um, more and more people are getting these chronic non-healing wounds. So what kind of wounds are these? Well, these may be diabetic foot ulcers. These may be pressure ulcers from people in long-term care. Um, and these are other types of arterial insufficiency injuries where people just have these wounds that don't heal. So what we proposed is that we could use photoacoustic imaging to not only uh, detect wounds and monitor their response to therapy, but we could also use photoacoustic imaging to even predict when these wounds might erupt before they're visible by eye. And so this was another paper by Ali um, in Wound Repair and Regeneration. It was actually on the cover of that journal um, last year. So the first work we did was with an animal model, and this is kind of a gruesome surgery, but what we did is implanted a magnet inside the animal beneath its gastrocnemius in the leg, allowed that to heal, and then placed an external magnet on the skin. And that pressure between the two magnets modeled a pressure injury. And so by, so the anesthesia surgery to implant the magnet allowed that to heal, and then, would do increasing number of rounds of magnetic treatment. 
And so more rounds of magnetic treatment would lead to higher and higher stages of uh, a pressure injury, something that would model a bed sore, basically. So what we first did was compare um, our, our model to, uh, to the human scenario using histology. Um, and so we looked at healthy skin. So here you can see an intact epidermis and dermis, healthy looking muscle. But as we go through these advanced stages, you appreciate the dysregulation of the epidermis here, then the dermis, and then at these advanced stages, we even start to dysregulate the underlying muscle tissue. So this was simply to validate that our model is recapitulating the human scenario. We next did some um, initial wound imaging. Um, and here you can appreciate these different stages that were validated by, <clears throat> validated by histology. The black and white, again, is the regular pulse echo ultrasound. The red pixels are the photoacoustic ultrasound overlaid. And so what you'd appreciate is as the stages progress, not only do we see more photoacoustic signal, but the photoacoustic signal is deeper into tissue than at lower stages. Um, here is an animal that we imaged at very early stages. Um, and this is now with the LED-based system. And you can appreciate the ultrasound, the photoacoustics. This is in a healthy animal. In an animal where we've added stage one, you can very obviously appreciate with the LED-based system the differences uh, between uh, background and the beginning of disease right here with this ulcer. What's most importantly, sorry, these are a little out of order. Um, we could quantitate and show the difference between these different stages, both with the pixel intensity and with the pixel depth. But what was really exciting was looking at these very early stages of disease. So here, the, uh, the pressure injury or the, the model of bed sores it's only apparent by eye in stage one, but we wanted to look at this very early stage of lesion before it's even visible by eye. And what we showed here using the LED-based system is that using photoacoustics, we could start to detect these very subtle changes in, uh, in the tissue in the third or fourth cycle of magnetic treatment. So this is potentially suggestive that we could detect a pressure injury before it's even erupted and before it's even become visible. Um, by eye. And so that could guide some kind of intervention and uh, potentially some treatment to prevent the, the, the skin from breaking. Because once the skin breaks, it becomes increasingly difficult to treat it. So fast forward about a year um, and a lot of paperwork later, uh, we have started translating this into the clinic. And so this is now the Cyberdyne LED-based system that we've uh, configured to put it on a cart. Um, it's plugged in here, but we also have a battery for it. And so we can now move this around the clinic. Um, this was a technician, Chris, in the lab, and this is a scanning our very first patient. Um, and so we got to about patient number four and coronavirus hit. And so we were shut down for about uh, four months, but we have started scanning again in late July. Um, and so what I can show you is at least a case study of one human subject. This is unpublished data. What you can appreciate in this arterial insufficiency injury on the leg, so um, this is basically on the subject's shin. And here is the tibia in the uh, ultrasound. This is healthy adjacent tissue on the top. The bottom row is the wound. And so in both, you can appreciate the tibia. The blue pixels are at 690 excitation. The red pixels are at 850 nanometer excitation. And then this final column overlays all of the previous three panels. So what you can appreciate is that by eye, you might not, or excuse me, by, um, by just simple ultrasound, you might not appreciate any difference between the healthy tissue at top and the wound tissue on the bottom, but with the photoacoustics, we not only see higher photoacoustic signal on the skin surface, which makes sense because this is kind of a, a darker necrotic region, but we also see increased signal deeper into the wound. So whether this is real remains to be seen. We, um, it's difficult to do histology on humans, obviously, but uh, what we are doing is, is much more robust statistics and much larger 
sample cohorts. Uh, but this is an interesting case study. Uh, finally, I just want to mention a lot of the work that has been done in the lab on image processing. Um, Ali again and um, a colleague Moeen in the Netherlands have looked at a variety of techniques, um, including improved um, processing algorithms uh, to increase the, the contrast. And I'm going to show you just one example from Biomedical Optics Express that Ali read. No, I guess I'm not going to show you that. Um, but if you go and read these papers, you'll appreciate the ability to image deeper into tissue because the problem that we have with LED based imaging is relatively low fluence, as I mentioned. And so anything that we can do to overcome that low fluence is particularly useful to, um, to increase the contrast and increase the depth of penetration. So with that, I wanna thank everybody. This is Ali Hariri right here. He is gonna be graduating in about a year and I think he would be a fantastic hire for any firm in the area of biomedical optics or electrical engineering. Um, I also wanna thank Chris and Yash who have been doing a lot of the uh, clinical scanning. And I also wanna thank Cyberdyne for, uh, for all of their help. Um, Mithin and uh, Naoto for, for helping um, troubleshoot a lot of the issues we've had and you for your attention.